Netflix heavily invested in offering a reliable experience even when recovering from a system failure. And now you can do it too with a simple Nougat package. But how Netflix has done that? Which Nougat package is that one? How can you use it? I will show you all of that in this video. There are many options involved in controlling availability, from load balancing to circuit breakers and static concurrency limits. What raises the question, how many requests can a service handle simultaneously? And that is hard to answer, but in this video you will find a way. But how Netflix got into here? Do you recall those early pandemic days when you logged into your Netflix account, expecting to watch a series and it crashed? Even Netflix that is obsessed with availability suffered on those days. And they realized that even having a lot of techniques in place to offer a reliable experience, when some part of the system was under failure, it could put the whole system under an extreme load. So what could be done? And as in many things in software development, we get inspiration from the world out there. And if electric engineering gave us the circuit breakers, they also gave us a new thing, load shedding. Load shedding is a technique to prevent the failure of a complete system by shutting down some parts of the system, protecting it that way. So if you bring the concept into software development, load shedding is a practice to keep the system stable and available even when the system is overloaded. In simple terms, we reduce the load and we prevent the system from crashing because we know that having a system running at 100% capacity of the resources is not a system properly managed. So sometimes we have to take some hard decisions, dropping some requests so we can focus our resources on achieving critical tasks. So this way we can keep serving the most important requests even when we are facing extreme load. So Netflix decided to apply this concept into their systems, but they decided to go with an approach where they would classify their requests by priority. This way they will preserve the service availability by load shedding low priority requests. So they analyzed all the requests that go through their services and they classify them according to the importance of the request, the priority, how critical they are, so they could apply load shedding to those. So if a request is low priority, they could drop it if needed. So to Netflix, the priority is to serve me content. Other things like managing my profile or accessing the, my history or recording some logs have low value when comparing to serving to the client's content. So they could classify the requests according to that. So in moments of need, they can stop serving me those low priority requests in order to keep giving me the best experience to watch new content, the thing that I pay for. And this concept is extremely interesting. But how can we do that in .NET? The good news is that now you have an out-of-the-box way, a plug-and-play way of doing this, and it's quite simple. You just need to use this new open-source project that is load shedding. And the interesting thing about load shedding is that not only it gives you access to this load shedding concept that I just explained to you, but also the team took a few more steps and they introduced the concept of adaptive concurrency limits, what basically removes a manual task of trying to find the optimal limit of concurrency for your services while you keep a low latency on those services. Finding those values depends on a lot of factors. Simple things like the server resources or the network latency will have a huge impact on those limits. So having a system that dynamically tries to find the optimal level is a cool thing to have in place in your system and it doesn't cost a lot. So what do you gain by adopting this library? First, and obviously, it will bring load shedding into your ASP.NET APIs, but also we'll do it in a dynamic way. So you will not need to do some fine tuning to find some limits to keep your system running. It will also bring you the concept of priorities and we'll see those in a moment. And those priorities can be by either or endpoint. It gives you events where you can see what happened with each request, if it's rejected or not, but also we'll expose some metrics that you can use to observe your system, to see how load shedding is applying into your system so you can react in a, a proper way. For example, scaling the system when you see a lot of requests being rejected. But before showing you the library in action, let me explain you how it works. In simple terms, load shedding will have a queue where all requests coming in go through. Then they will be assigned to different threads processing the requests. 
If all the threads are busy processing some requests, it will start putting the requests inside of a queue, up to a given limit. The queue will act as a first-in, first-out. So when a thread finishes processing a previous request, some request in the queue will be assigned to that thread. And if the queue is full and we have a new request, it will automatically be dropped. So it will be rejected with a 503 service unavailable. But if you have priority in place, and a new request comes in with high priority, it will be put in front of the queue and it will drop another request from that queue. So this way, the system will keep the low latency because even requests being rejected doesn't spend a lot of time in a queue to be rejected after all. And also it conserves and preserves the system resources and keeps processing, especially the high priority requests. And the library will start with a defined capacity for the system and then we'll start reacting based on the response time and the latency of the system and adjusting that limit dynamically. So you don't need to adjust those limits by yourself. So all the requests that come when we are under the capacity will be processed. Then if we are above the capacity, they will be put on the queue. Then if we fulfill the complete size of the queue, those requests will start to be rejected. But in the meanwhile, the system might realize that we still have room for growing, so we are still processing requests at a good pace. So we can adjust that capacity and raise it a bit, so automatically fine-tune the system to the best performance, keeping low latency. And that is the beauty of the system. But now let's take a look on how to use it. I have here a simple API that, by the way, you can grab the source code as a patron if you want. And this is basically the simple weather API that you have when you create a new project on .NET, but with a small difference. I'm getting the forecast from a Postgres database. At the moment, this API doesn't have load shedding in place, and I deployed it into Azure, into a low resource website and we'll run a load test against it. On the repo, you can also find the K6 script that will run to perform a load test. And what I want to check is the percentage of requests that I have for each status code. And I want to pay extra attention to this 500, since it's the sign that something went wrong inside of the service. So it might be an indicator that the service is not responding due to some infrastructure resources problems. So let's run this script before we add load shedding into it. Okay, results are back. And we can see that 13% of the requests failed with a 200. 59% failed with a 500, so an internal server error. And obviously this doesn't make 100%, right? And that happened because many of the requests eventually start timing out because the website blew up. This website is running with the minimum resources possible. The website and the database. But that is the goal, is to show you that at some point the system will break. And I will keep this information here so we can run this test again once we have load shedding in place. And let's do it now. The first thing that you need to do is to install the package. And the package is this one farfetch.loadshedding.aspnet core because it's to ASP.NET that we want to add it. So install it in the way that you prefer to do it and then go to your program.cs and let's configure load shedding. So builder.services add load shedding. So this is the default definition. To use it, the next thing that you need to do is right before mapping the controllers, you will say use load shedding. So this will add load shedding in place. There's other things that we can do, but before I want to show you the difference that this will make to that service that we ran the load test against. So I will deploy this version of the code and I will run the test again and we'll get back once I have the results to compare those. Okay, results are back and we can see that in 70% of the cases we have a 200 OK and we have no requests with a 500, that's good, and we have 29% with a 503. So that means that for 29% of the requests, the service decided that it didn't have the resources in order to keep the service alive, and he had to drop some cases on, and those 29% was a decision by the load shedding mechanism to drop them. And the good news is that with just those two lines of code, we now can see that the system is still alive. We were able to keep it at a reliable state 
keeping it alive and always available. The trade-off that we had to have is that for some cases we had to fail it gracefully. So we decided in 29% of the cases in these conditions to drop the request. And this is extremely good news when compared to the scenario that we have observed in the previous case. But this becomes even more interesting when we bring other things in place like prioritization. Let me show you. In this scenario, we have two controllers in our API. One to get the weather forecasts, that is the one we have been testing, and another one to access the preferences of the user. So this is just doing a delay for demo purposes. But you can see the point. So you have something that is your core business and you need to keep serving, but something like the user adjusting, for example, the preferred language or configuring some settings or accessing some historic data, those things might not be as important as accessing the weather data recurrently, right? So if this is a weather API. So we can take some decisions like adding here um, an attribute where we can define that the endpoint priority for this case is non-critical. And in the other one, we can do exactly the same, but this time say that it is a critical request. By doing this, the load shedding mechanism will always favor the weather forecast. So by default, it will try to discard preferences request first before start ignoring the ones to get the weather forecast. Once you have this attribute in place, you just need to do one simple thing that is in your definition of load shedding, you can go to the options and say adaptive limiter, use endpoint priority resolver. And as you can see, you have another options. For example, you can use an adder to decide that. If you are in a scenario with microservices, maybe you can take that decision through an adder where the client can take that decision for you. So with this in place, you already have that mechanism that Netflix is applying to decide which requests you should favor, which ones you should discard in case your system can keep with that load. So this is one interesting scenario where you can use. The other thing that you can do is that you can go to the options and access the subscribe events. This will let you add code to multiple scenarios so you can react in case something happened. For example, is this request going into the queue? Is this request being rejected? You can write your own code in case of those things happening. But also, you can bring metrics in place. So currently, load shedding supports exposing metrics to Prometheus. And to do that, you need to bring another package. That is this one, farfetch load shedding .prometheus. install it. And once you have it, you can go to your options and say, options add metrics. And if you have that in place, load shedding will start exposing some metrics based on things like the current number of requests in the queue. You, you can see, for example, the ones that are being discarded, the metric regarding that. And then you can start reacting to those. Maybe you can start automating your system to bring new instances of that service in case you are dropping too many requests due to load shedding. And if you are curious about the impact of a library like this one in your API, the repo has some benchmarks in place and you can find them through a link in the description. But what I can tell you is that it has a small footprint and as you can see, it's extremely simply to use. It brings a lot of benefits to your system. But with that, don't think that load shedding will solve all of your problems. And that's why you need to watch this video as well so you can manage your API resources effectively.